Thank you very much. It is such a pleasure to be here in Nevada. And I love so many corners in Nevada. And I'm going to say this to my, my friends. I don't know if I'm going to upset our folks at Pearson or whatever, but the acoustics in this room suck, right? <laughs> they just <laughs> suck. I've been trying to fix it. So I'm going to say, if, if you want to make this cool, just grab your chair and pull it up. Let's make this a more intimate room. Don't be shy. It's my party. Uh, just come on up. We've got these folks are going to bring their chairs up back here. You know, so just come on up. Don't be shy. Man in a yellow shirt and tie, come on up. Come on up. You want to you stay there because you're closer to the peanuts and cranberries. But come on up. Guys, and I also want to do a shout out here. I've been watching very intensely from the back. Uh, hold on here for a second. We've got, we've got Kathleen, Kelly, Deborah, Michelle, and Lori. Did I have that right? Do I have all your names? You guys are intense. You've been taking notes and you've been like focused on every word. I don't know if it's because you haven't heard it or what, but are you in workforce stuff? Lightened it up. You are, okay. So you're gonna get the first round of questions. Anyway, I just wanted to make this a little more intimate. Those of you who wanna sit in the back of the class, I respect that, but I gotta tell you, it's a lot more fun up here. Uh, anyway, I'm Steve, I'm with The Atlantic, and I like to, you know, razz things up a little bit. And why don't you pull up a little bit? This is, you know, there's, there are no rules here. Of course um, you This is actually a very heavy chair. But you're the president of a technical college, right? So, I, no, that is not correct. <laughs> um, a community college. So, so we're here to talk about the high tech path, the high wage jobs. And what I'd like to try and get at and have a conversation with you and uh, bring in our, our friends in the audience. This is probably my phone, right? Hold on. Uh, airplane mode. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, I, I'm really interested in going a little bit deeper on this question of how a state changes its stars, if you will, chases the content of its workforce and begins to try to really struggle and, and deal with what we kind of talk amorphously about, you know, jobs of the future, whatever they may be, when we have people who have built homes, built, built the communities we're in, they're incumbent in those communities, and they're being told, you're not worth as much if you don't code. And Karin, I'm interested in your thoughts, because you are president of the Truckee Med Meadows Community College, and I'm interested, you know, I'm gonna have some fun with you for a minute. If you were, because I don't know that much right now, I want you to tell us about what you're doing to sort of bridge this, but if you were to grade yourself from A to F, <laughs> on how you're doing in this. Where, what are you doing well and what are you not doing well? So, I'll start by saying, this is my 30th year. And okay, that's not my phone. Uh, okay, go ahead. So I've been in community colleges since about 1986. And a lot like the previous panelists, I was a waitress uh, through my own and was very lucky that after a year as a part-time faculty member, got a full-time job in I've been working on this puzzle, not a problem, but a puzzle, about 30 years, starting in the role of faculty member, vice president, college president, and college. So if I were to grade um, myself personally, versus colleges are built, I'd give myself an A. I've worked yeah. yeah. All right, now if you're going to grade everybody else. <laughs> Your colleagues. Grade? My colleagues. Um, I would give uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, most of my colleagues, and, however, I think one of the struggles in higher education, and this is where I would give us a B, is I think we're, we're a little bit behind the curve on where the paradigm has gone because of the digital age. That now we have learners who go to bed at night with their cell phones on their pillows, right? that the way my 20-year-old daughter takes in information is very, very different from my 30-year-old son, just within that 10-year period of time. So the way we process information, synthesize information, express information has radically changed. And I think for some faculty, they're right on top of it, but there's some faculty who have some work to do. And then we have this wonderful new crop of younger faculty, I'll just say it as politically incorrect as that might be, but these younger faculty, they get it, they've grown up with it, they've lived it, and we hired about you know, 14 of them this past year at Truckee Meadows Community College, 
And, and I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled, because that, that generational divide is closing in very, very quickly. And I think that's Before important. I leave you, but I mean, uh, uh, right now, I, 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 Pearson is issuing a, a, a report, I believe today, right, on uh, uh, adult learning, the anxieties of it. What's interesting is there's less anxiety than I thought there'd be, yeah. but there's more knowledge and awareness that they need to keep up with that that next generation through continuing education and things like that. And I'm interested in, you know, as you just defined it, the younger generation is the hope, is the aspiration, you know, brings this new toolkit in. What do you think can we do with incumbent workers, incumbent residents that, you know, to kind of diminish that gap, diminish that sense that, you know, yeah. when, when are we gonna see an older generation that still has, you know, some edge on the younger generation? So I just met a fellow the other day at Truckee Meadows Community College in our new manufacturing facility, a manufacturing training ground, if you will. He's in his 60s. Uh, he still needs to work. He's a retired law enforcement, but he needs to work. And he, he has learned program logic control skills. So he's learning how to code. And I guess my, the bottom line is right. community colleges have been doing this for years years, taking people of all age groups, of all socioeconomic strata, of all different skill sets, and giving them what they need to succeed in industry or to transfer to universities. And I think that's a really important point. The reason why Truckee Meadows isn't a tech school is we couldn't afford to be a tech mm -hmm. school. By Really, seriously, 60% of our students come to us with this sole intent of transferring to a university. We do a right. great, three of my children are community college graduates. They all transferred to universities. And, and if it weren't for the, the 35 students in a large psychology class, we couldn't fund a production assistant program that's, that's teaching people for a, a new blossoming manufacturing sector. So for our budget, it's really important that we are viewed as comprehensive community colleges and that we do both equally well. And I'm very proud of that because we do a, a great job in both of those arenas. Cool. Now, Christy, you are executive vice president of awesomeness. Such yeah. a cool title. Did you pick that title yourself or was it, you know, you did not. You actually applied for that job, you know, and, and, and you had to go through and say, how are you awesome? Okay. Um, at Switch, why, why do you think Switch in a sense, is, is a good metaphor for what the state is aspiring to do uh, in defining the new Nevada. Well, I think, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting company, right? Our CEO and founder, Rob Roy, made it his film. Tell folks what your company does, because there are lots of people all over the world outside Nevada that yeah. don't know. All right, so Switch yeah. is the world's best data center. It happens to be right here in, in Nevada. Um, we store data. We're a data center company. We also offer um, all of the services that make companies live today, basically, on the internet. Um, we make SuperNAP is the name of those data centers. Um, uh, NAP is a network, network access point. And Do you have many Russians dropping by? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's super. <laughs> <laughs> so ba basically, we are the infrastructure that makes the internet work. Is I see. the easiest way to hear that. But uh, we basically made a decision when we started to uh, create what our philanthropic focus would be, and it was going to be the state of Nevada and its economic development. Right. That translates directly for us as education. So that's why we sit here today and why we would be on a panel like this and mm -hmm. why we work like So how do you see the pipeline? Not to interrupt, but how do you see the pipeline out there? I remember when I worked in the 1990s in the Senate for the senator from New Mexico, mm -hmm. and we had companies like Intel and Intuit and other tech companies coming into Rio Rancho and other parts of the state, there was an incredible uh, problem. Intel would get the highest paid and most trained workers. Everyone else had to work at a lower level down the pyramid. But then you pretty saw those people that were kind of considered trained and capable of that area, they too had to go out and invest in education. But they did these advertisements, I remember, just to sort of test the job environment. So when you go and do that in Nevada, what is the real diagnosis of the skill set capabilities and, and, uh, of the state for meeting your kind of company's needs? Well, we're not scared. We feel very proud of Nevada workers and we feel like we have more, more capability than any other state in the world to get this done. And, and that gets done through collaboration. So companies like ours and, and others that are in the tech sector, and frankly, every company is in the tech sector right now, FYI. <laughs> so all of these companies are creating these innovative positions mm. 
so it's the collaboration to, with education that allows us, as we're creating those positions, we are co-creating curriculum to make sure that people can come through and easily get a job in, in our environment or any other environment like ours. So we're also really focused on, we, we kind of have a two-pronged approach. So it's our Innovation Center, Rob Roy's Innovation Centers, um, and Switch University. And so, you know, we're starting to really perfect micro-learning in different ways of going, what exactly do you need to know to get this position in manufacturing or mission critical? So, you know, we're, we're going, I don't have a job today and I don't have the tool sets. What, how, what is the, the, the direct pathway to having an, a job, and not just a job, but a career that really makes sense for our state? I was interested in what people do on their, on their time off, and it was interesting that, uh, uh, Christy told me she travels. Uh, Karen tells me that she's an HBO buff. Anything on HBO, it doesn't matter if it's only an HBO show. But Manny told me he's an amateur boxer and a poet. Yeah. So cool. definitely win there. Um, but, I'm, but I'm interested, Manny, in, in, your, in your real work, which is thinking about workforce innovation mm -hmm. and, and what you see. And to a certain degree, when you work in the state, you mm -hmm. see the sort of same data sets that I, that I asked Christy about and Karen. So I, I want to ask you the tough question, which is, I don't want this to be a rah-rah forum that everything the state of Nevada is doing is so wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So what are, you, what, what, are you, what are you worried about when you look at the data that you're trying to fix? Um, that's a good question. So one point that I'll bring up to Christy's point, which is actually implicit in her job title, as we're thinking about the workforce of the future, there's an obvious need for more individuals with technical skills. However, ironically, so one piece with the Office of Workforce Innovation around our mission, which is creating a skilled, diverse, and aligned workforce. So one of the ways we try to do that is one, using labor market data, and then two, employer engagement. So we manage these things called industry sector councils, right, where we convene employers to provide insights on industry needs. And across all eight industries, so all of the eight emerging industries, one of the skill sets that has been consistent is the need for technical skills. However, so let's say you're in gaming and services and, and, and tourism. Is mm -hmm. that true in that, that sector? That is true for gaming and tourism. It's true for aerospace. It's true for any of the other eight industry sectors, even construction, because of how automation and artificial intelligence, AI, is transforming how everyone works. However, there's a second point, and it goes to your question around what's needed. What we hear a lot of employers say is that, particularly for millennials, and I'll say I'm a baby boomer, I was born around World War II, um, but for most of the baby boomers, they lack the soft skills. And so that's important. So I heard one employer say, we actually hire for hard skills, but most of the time we fire is for soft skills, meaning teamwork. And if you want to think about management, you have to go from an individual worker, whether you're working in coding or software development and all those pieces, to doing a lot of teamwork um, and critical thinking. And that piece actually- Is that the A in, in STEAM? Say it again. Is it? it I, was, I, think it's, I think it's part of it, right? Which is that how are you building these teamwork? How are you kind of thinking outside the box, working well with others? And I think that's part of it. But going back to your, you know, the point is that I was surprised that the employees are saying. So, so what is? I mean, I, I see a lot. I mean, I interrupt, but I'm, I, it's my tendency. Um, <laughs> STEM. If somebody just went through a STEM program, mm -hmm. a, a, a man or woman who came through a STEM program, are we expecting somebody to come out without the soft skills, sort of robotic, kind of antisocial, but really smart with coding and? You know, a STEAM person mm. is sort of the artsy person who is really smart solving problems and likes lattes, or? I don't think that's what we, I don't think that's what we intend, but I think that's what happens. We overcompensate. Mm. So when we think about STEM, STEM was to push right. more individuals to engage and gain those skill sets because that's what employers needed. However, in at K-12 higher ed in society, we kind of right. overcompensated, so then the arts field started to push back. And so even though that's not how it's supposed to be, right. that's kind of been... Uh, you know, uh, unintended, unintended consequence. Oh, I'm just saying, 29 years ago, the first course that I was assigned as a full-time tenure-track communication faculty member, uh, well, there were two courses, job communication skills and leadership development. So I walk into the classroom, it was all automotive guys. 
And then I walk into my second classroom and it was a mix of heavy equipment students, HVAC students, some cosmetologists thrown in. Who was more a fun? A couple of colon actually, <laughs> I have to say the, the mix of, of cosmetology and culinary arts was a lot of fun, but they were all fun. Right. And so I think at community colleges, we've recognized that we have to offer soft skills in, in tandem with all of our uh, professional, technical, or career tech ed training programs. How a college decides to do that, that differs from one community college to the next. And I know, I've only been at TMCC for, uh, for a few months, but we had a fun conversation back, mm -hmm. you know, back in the green room, and, and I'm gonna now go back and look how, how well are we doing at the soft skills based on what Christy shared. Uh, we do some, a great collaboration is occurring now with Switch, it's, it's really fantastic. And it's a kind of collaboration where industry sits at the table with community college uh, administrators. We figure out a very specific curriculum, and in this case, uh, the latest one, we got some federal dollars to help revamp our, one of our spaces because Switch needs a lot of HVAC technicians. You gotta keep all those servers and hardware, you gotta keep it cool or it won't work. And so, you know, there's all, all, all kinds of, um, collaborations that occur at community colleges where industry have, and it's been occurring for many, many years. Let me ask Christy, you know, there, there's one way to think about it where you've got a lot of workers and they, right. you know, live in their communities now, the norms and design of the communities and, and how they work are, are largely written. And, and then you, you, you did raise this issue of sort of the next generation of people coming in and what they expect in their lives right. and the quality of life issue. And I'm really interested, this is not a forum today about entrepreneurship, but it is about a forum about where, how you get talent, how you cultivate talent, and how you keep talent. And I'm interested to what degree, as Nevada benchmarks itself against other communities competing for that talent, what do you think is, needs to happen on the quality of life side uh, partic I, I wouldn't even say for younger people, but just to kind of create communities that kind of pop a little bit more. Christy? Well, I think... Uh most and do you agree? Of, I do agree. I think most of the uh, research that's done and research that we do is that it is culture. So creating a great culture, not only in your company, but how you, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on the community and giving back. And people that work at Switch have this pride, you know, that they walk into a, in just about anywhere in the state of Nevada and they're acknowledged for what they do for the mm. community. So that means a lot to a human to go home at night and go, I'm part of, I'm part of that. But also, you know, in, inside the house, we hear about it all over uh, locally here, um, companies, uh, you know, the sexiness behind a Google right. or a Tesla or all these companies that create that culture piece. And we spend a lot of energy on that because we care, you know, we provide lunches, we do all the things, but it's, I think more than anything is the outreach into the community and being somebody that shows up and, and makes a difference mm -hmm. in some way, in some form. And I, and it's, you know, I think it's important too for, and I'm gonna skip back, because since we're doing the interrupter thing, <laughs> skipping back to the, yeah. Uh, I'm just preparing for the debate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but back, I think it's important for educators and communities to hear that, that we have conversations around and the mission critical, our EVP of mission critical um, right. services says, we've got to stop, we have to find people who can communicate so mm -hmm. that I know steam can be heated for some people, but it's a really, really important thing that people are learning how do i communicate how do i problem solve because mm. we can't have an engineer or or mission critical person come in that's dealing with equipment and not be able to communicate with sure. our clients and the world is changing like that right there's mm. there's micro jobs and there's you know all mm. these different roles that you have to play and that interdisciplinary mindset and whole mind is mm. going to be really important because the world is different right and thank you short short form yeah. Fanny? I would say two really quickly. One is exposure. We need students earlier on to be exposed to the type of options that are out there because in some cases it is mutually exclusive and that you're only interested in what you're exposed to. And then number two I would say is once they're exposed to those various worlds and jobs of the future, to also be, uh, be thoughtful about the skill sets. So job titles are essentially obsolete. The role I'm currently in didn't exist a year ago and you can't really say this is the job you're exactly going to have in 10 years. We don't know, robots might take over, right? Um, but it's thinking about what are the skill sets, and this is the work that the Department of Education- I mean, you did raise the high-tech path to high-wage jobs. It could be the high-tech path to, right. to no jobs. 
Uh, but no, we won't go there think, today. But, I think, but, I, but, I think to that point, but automation is a big right, deal. Automation, artificial intelligence. But I yeah. think to that point, once you have the exposure, it's being thoughtful about what are the skill sets that are needed so that those skill sets can adapt, and that goes to Chrissy's point, to any job title. And this is where the career pathway piece and Just really, in. really fast, do you think there are things you can do to make the pathway for adult learners mm -hmm. and those that are incumbents out there just make it easier, make, you know, I don't know whether to call it stigma or how to animate it, mm -hmm. how to incentivize it so that there's, you know, we, I think we fake our interest in support of life, lifelong learning. Right, I think right. we fake it, to be mm -hmm. candid. We don't really create an environment that is um, as open. And I'm just interested in whether you, we're going to make the entire state of Nevada <laughs> and hang it on your shoulders. Are you doing enough to make that happen? Um. I think we're working. I think we're making progress to it by having more conversations around integrated systems. So to that point around how are we working for adults, it's about integrating more systems. And so K-12 higher ed employers can no longer work in isolation. Right. And so part of you know mm -hmm. our role is our success is really graded on how are we integrating different systems. So when you think about workforce development, um, I know the Department of Employment data. Uh, they're actually working right. on integrating their systems together so you can go one place to get all your services. Karin, real quick. The question about young people or well, where I'd you went say with adult learners? Do you think you need to change, <laughs> the, change the environment here to keep talent? You know, I, I do think that there is a different generation who they care about sharing, hmm. they care about arts, they care about music. Uh, I think their expectations have been lowered about how much uh, they need to get paid just mm. because they've grown up in a pretty devastating, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, what, right. what, what was that in 2008? <laughs> you know, I just never want to be part of that again, right? And so I think that that has a, a, a lot of, of ch it presents challenges for community colleges because we, we, are, we pride ourselves on being responsive. We pride mm. ourselves on creating warm, comfortable environments where anyone can come and get access to public higher education of all kinds. Right. And so we, we are trying to create a, a cultures that are more inviting, even as simple, through simple things like furnishings and, and having a library where you can bring in a cup of coffee. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're having those conversations in higher ed. And I think that's important. I really do. What does an associate's degree at Truckee cost? Uh, right now, we run about $92 per credit, and an associate is that, degree is 60 credits. So, yeah, so pretty good like deal. Sounds like a deal. Sounds like a deal. It okay. is a deal. Yep. Uh, I want to go to the audience here. We've yeah. just got a couple of minutes, but where are my friends? They don't, they don't even know they're my friends. <laughs> Kathleen, <laughs> Kelly, Deborah, Michelle, and Lori. I so, I went around and I lurked, and I took their names off their name tags without them knowing. So there's got to be a, ta a question over there, right? You go first. Is there a question at the table? Because you guys have been working really hard. Yeah. Uh, my name is Deborah Salton. I'm with uh, Vegas PBS. I'm the Director of Workforce Training and Economic mm -hmm. Development there. Um, one of the things I hear, hear several things. Right. Um, but while we say we don't want to talk about entrepreneurialism, that's not what it's about. Um, I'm on a panel on Friday talking about the gig worker. And because and probably many people don't even know what the gig worker is. And that's a contingent worker. I do. Thank I you. Mean, I mean, I, I think that, it, it, I mean, to, to be quite candid and not to editorialize here, and you know, maybe uh, my, my colleagues here would want to comment, if, if Nevada isn't competitive for gig workers, then you're behind other states, right? So Absolutely. Yeah. And, but, but I also think that we're working in workforce with some preconceived ideas about how it should look mm. and not engaging those millennials who's, who are saying, this is how I want it to look. Well, that's in part what I was asking about in terms of quality of life, but other kind of... How, how you restructure work also. Restructure work, restructure the value of family in your community, mm -hmm. restructuring how we look at volunteerism in our community, because that new workforce wants kind of a combination of both. Right, that's a and wonderful, wonderful So, comment. you know, that was one of my comments, just kind of, you know, taking notes, saying, well, we're still talking about things that we talked about 20 years ago. Right. Um, 50 years ago with STEM education and stuff. So we have to look at what's this new workforce going to look like and what are their expectations, and start to crafting things around the things that will be attractive for them, and not necessarily how we've done business before. And I think that's the, the one thing that we've, we've missed. That, that's great. So hold your thoughts on that. Let me get this gentleman right here, too. And did you have one over there? We're going to get these three, and then we'll give a, um, 
quick response before we go to our next panel. Hi, hi. My, hi my name is Jonathan. I'm a principal at ATEC, which is a local CTA here. And I just want to know, you know, you talk about opportunities for all these students, and we, we totally agree with you. That's why we work at CTAs. But how do you get the teachers who could make more in the private field? How do you get them to Great say, question. we want to work in the high school for lower amounts of money? That's a great question. Did I see a hand go up there, or did you were just like, you know, if, you, if I went in an auction, the, the gentleman, yeah, you just turned around. <laughs> yeah, I saw your hand. You know, in an auction, you'd be buying the painting, man. So I <laughs> know, just joking. Uh, was there another question over here? Yes. Uh huh. Right here. Thank you. My name is Kara Pally. I work for Aging and Disability Services Division. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to project a little bit. Oh, okay. I work for Aging and Disability Services Division. And I'm wondering if any of you could speak to working with people with disabilities. Um, we're really focused on transition age youth right. and the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and working together with vocational rehabilitation in the schools to get people competitive employment. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. That is a wonderful question. So can we, did we have one other over there? So let's, we'll take one last and then we'll go to, to all of you. So disabilities, and I'll remind you of all this. <laughs> This is like a college test at Truckee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm out. <laughs> Hi, my name's Craig Hutzler. I'm retired. I'm a retired Air Force pilot and aerospace executive. And I did some teaching in the secondary school system here. What I want to know is in this whole flash up, I hear a lot of things about so-called technology, which is really electronics and software. And I'm very familiar with that in the airplanes. Right. But I hear nothing about opportunities here in Nevada in hard sciences, physics, chemistry, engineering, especially Did materials. you say opportunities in hard science? Yeah, and, and the technologies that go with them. Right, mm -hmm. so I, we, the acoustics are just as bad this way, um, but I think I got them. Um, so we had a question really about millennials and designing around millennial aspirations mm -hmm. and mill millennial prerogatives and kind of changing the conversation uh, from what it was 50 years ago or 20 years ago. Great, great comment. Then one on how do you, uh, bring teachers in who, who and, and, and keep them, you know, helping the next generation on when we basically don't give them the rewards or compensation to do that. How do you make that equation work? Uh, an interesting question on disabilities and how this equation mm -hmm. fits in that broad arena, and I have a short comment there. Uh, and then a last question on really how do you, how do you deal with the hard science world? You know, I, mean, I was up at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the um, east side of Washington State recently. It's not very well known, but I met some of the smartest people in the world there. And I was sort of interested in how that community is looking at and, and whether or not that's part of the equation too. So you each have 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> no, we'll go a little bit over. I know we're over. My, my team is already upset at me, but uh, go ahead, Christy. Um, well, what was the first one again? Um, <laughs> millennials. Right. Yes, millennials. So and teachers. I, I think it's, if any of you have been to an innovation center, uh, it's a rubber innovation center, both uh, edges of the state. But we focus a lot on how does it look and feel? How does the space look? Design, branding, and marketing, and the way we speak about what we do is really important. So how do we get people involved in these new, new industries? They have to know about it, and they have to know about it in a really cool way. That's mm -hmm. why I keep pushing the STEAM thing. It's the A that allows us to market and really have people get excited about this, this new world and how they can be involved in it. Hard science? Make it fun, um, make it relatable, make the connection. I used to teach um, elementary and middle school, um, and I would say the one takeaway I would say is make it relatable, connect the dots. So it can't be learned in abstract. You have to actually go out to engage them, the students. Teachers, disabilities. Oh my gosh. Okay, uh, number one, uh, I it, don't go into teaching if the only reason you're doing it is for the money. You won't be a good teacher, number one. I, do, I just have to be brutally honest with that. I think the best faculty and teacher, it's nice if you make a little money as you move up the salary schedules, but you got to go in it for the passion of the student and for the love of your discipline, or it's not going to work for anybody. Number two, disabilities. I have a lot of experience with that in my former institution uh, near upstate New York. One of the most innovative things we did was we invited, uh, right as I was leaving, we created right. a community farm on campus. And the students who were running it in the summer were students who were uh, with pretty uh, uh, interesting developmental disabilities working with our culinary arts students. The last thing I'll say is we do a lot of science at TMCC. We've even, we even own three cadavers, which for a community college is great. We do a lot of chemistry and a lot of pre-engineering courses. So we're all over that. 
Real quick, Manny, yeah, real really fast. Quickly, um, I guess to add for the disability, I think it's important for education to educate adults because we still have expectation of what people with disabilities can and can't do. So we need to actually educate adults and educators ab about that. And then two, around the question around the teachers um, and millennials, um, very quickly, one is real culture fast. and flexibility. Yeah. Culture and yep. flexibility. Yeah. Uh, I agree. So I, really, I was going to say uh, flexibility, bringing uh, millennials into planning, I mean, is, yeah. is the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, on teachers, um, I, would, I would in a very friendly way disagree with Karn. I think it's a tragedy mm -hmm. uh, for society if we don't figure out a way to pay and compensate excellence in teaching. Um, I would say on disabilities, uh, a friend of mine, Jim McKelvey, who was a co-founder of a company called Square, that's the one thing you can use a credit <laughs> card on your little phone, he has a group called Launch Code. The secret of Launch Code is it is training people who've had some bump in their life. They may, they may be disabled, they may have uh, gone to prison, they may have something that they're getting around, and he's taking these people that want to code and learn and giving them a second chance. Human resource departments wouldn't hire them. So he began using his celebrity and calling, there's this one guy, uh, who, who's uh, um, you know, partially paralyzed, but he says he's one of the best coders in the United States and helped him get a job at uh, Cisco and began calling HR departments. So if any of you are in HR departments, this is a movement to get HR departments to, to stop being so risk averse and begin opening the aperture, if you will, for the people they consider. So I think that goes for a broad section of the community, not just the disabled. And then on the broad science of science, if you're a pilot you know, who served in the Air Force, you've got uh, space projects here, you know, talent builds and breeds talent. So all you need is basically a cluster of people that think it's really important. Have folks put a spotlight on it, 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 it builds. And I, I really strongly believe in the kind of resource that you represent. So that was my little comment. But please give a round of applause right. to my panelists here. Thanks. Carl Hilgerson, Manny Lamar, and Christy Overgaard. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you.